and we should be good to go, Ed. All right. For those of you who are coming, thank you for joining me in the now aptly named Dave Kennedy Overflow Room, <laughs> um, also known as Threat Intelligent Management Anonymous. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is, is around threat intelligence management, uh, specifically the processes, the steps, the technology that goes into it. Now, before I start, I do want to say that at the end of this, there's an opportunity to win a DerbyCon ticket. So who doesn't have a DerbyCon ticket? A couple? All right. So you have the opportunity, based upon the, the today's discussion uh, and, and talk, to win a DerbyCon ticket. Who would want to win one? Anybody? Of course. Okay. Yes. All right. So a little bit about myself. I'm an Iowa farm boy. I used to be very happy. Uh, I am a technology geek. Uh, wife's not so happy. Um, very not happy over the fact that I have not gone to using a tablet yet. So I am a veteran of the Navy. Any other veterans? Military? One? Thank you for your service. Uh, I actually thought I could actually pull this mustache off. As you can tell, I, I don't do that anymore. Um, I'm a big science fiction fan. Is, it, is anybody else a sci-fi fan? <laughs> Who's waiting for episode seven to come out of Star Wars? Yes. And for those of you who are wondering, I am in the picture. Uh, I'm the guy in white. Um, and I happen to be certified with a bunch of letters that normally are, falls on the other side of, of information security. And it's detailing around the information security side from the business perspective. Now, I do have a technical background. I also have a lot of time where I like to play Scrabble. And I, being a geek, I do like to come up with unique things. So one of the things I sat around one night was trying to figure out what does my certification actually spell. And lo and behold, whoa. Yeah. Uh, the mustache has returned. It will make a comeback. Ultimately, what that came out to spell is GIC IT crimes, which being in information security is kind of cool, right? Find IT crimes. So how many of us have done this? Where we've, you know, we've had our executives come in the room, you know, and they're, they're doing the dog and pony, and we're, we put this up on the screen. Who's, who's guilty of that? Uh, yeah, we all are, right? And we like to say, this is threat intelligence. Um, no, not really. It's pretty. It reminds me of war games, which I don't know, being the crowd that you are, if you remember that game. Um, however, it does bring the, the question when it comes to threat intelligence, what it can allow us to do. So what if we had the ability to get in front of some of these things that we see on a, on a regular basis? You know, the malware distribution. Anybody ever deal with viruses and, and getting malware out of their environment? It's not fun, is it? Especially when we have systems that start beaconing out to uh, known command and controls. Well, what if we could get out in front of that? Well, we could defend our businesses, which is kind of what we get paid for, right? You know, or does anybody just sit around and just collect a paycheck? Um, we can prioritize our resources because in information security, we tend to always have more people just sitting around waiting to do something than not, right? You know, we can make well informed decisions as well as ultimately reduce the impact to the, to the organization. So today what we're going to talk about is how, this, how I ended up in this, uh, in this space. Um, we'll take a look at what it takes to build an information or a threat intelligence program, what actually threat intelligence management is, um, as well as getting into some of the analysis side that goes into it, which analysis sort of kind of critical for threat intelligence. We'll take a look at an actual case study um, an actual, when we start talking about, you know, how this gets into the organization. Um, the big thing nowadays is anybody's management ever come back from a conference and go, we need threat intel? That, that management by conference never works, right? So we'll take a look at some of the, the case studies around actual application of threat intelligence as well as the business value and we'll discuss what I call the, the, the field of battle. So in the beginning there was the internet. Al sort of said it was good, because Al Gore created the internet, right, according to everything. So we're, we're familiar with security through obscurity, but I, I've gone into this next phase of saying, yeah, we're not doing that. We're just going to be basically you know, denying the, the issue. We're going to hope for the best, and we're going to have faith that the resources that we have come in. And over my expanse of my career, starting back, I, I started actually documenting some of the things I was hearing. You know, who would attack us? We're in Ohio. 
Okay, that's a great one because, you know, the Internet's only located in Ohio. So that, that made me start asking some serious questions that revolved around, you know, whiskey, tango. We'll stop there and go back to the alcohol because that's what we need. And ultimately what ended up happening is we, we've all heard the term Internet of Things, right? Anybody not familiar with that? I made the, the comment during a conference be, between two individuals, uh, one from the business, one from the technology, and I said, oh, IoT, it actually should be IoTD, the Internet of Bad Things, and immediately was accused of promoting FUD. And um, anybody ever, here, ever been accused of FUD? You know, the FUD peddler, the narcissistic vulnerability pimp? Yeah, so I definitely was not happy. I was rather upset. Um, because I saw a problem, but I was having a hard time understanding it. Um, did anybody think that internet-based attacks were not actually a threat to their organizations? Again, some of the common things that were being said. And again, being an Iowa farm boy, you know, when, when I'm faced with a problem, I like to tackle it head on. However, sometimes when I would hear things like this, it, it would just, I would be like, wait a minute, this isn't making sense. I'm hearing this but it's, you know, it's not connecting. So before we go on, let's go ahead and get in the right mindset. So two friends of mine, one of them being my partner at Rendition, have two very good, solid statements when it comes to, to adversarial activities against our organization. Rob Lee likes to say that, you know, we have zero influence on whether or not we're gonna be targeted as an organization. Do we all agree on that? Absolutely. We cannot sit there and say that this criminal syndicate's gonna choose us or not. Um, Jake likes to go the other opposite direction and say, you know, we, we get to choose one thing out of all of it, and that's where we do the field of battle. So how mature our organization is when it comes to configuration management, asset management, change management, these are critical. So ultimately, what I wound up doing when I was accused of FUD was going back to the basics. So I built one of these. And when I started this project, I swore to my wife that this was not going to be anything major. It was a pet project. It's like a bonsai tree, right? Well, unfortunately, it ended up turning into this. It got a little out of hand. And when I was running this, one of the things that I realized is that orange is not the new black when your husband is a geek, because my wife ended up seeing a lot of this, which trying to explain that, you know, no, no, this is not gonna be an impact. However, what I did learn is that when that happened, going here makes it all better. <laughs> so I was getting information, I deployed a number of honeypots, and was pulling in information. Now, I'm one of those people that I like to take the information back and, and take a look and see what's going on. So I could see where the attack was originating from because, you know, IP address from China means China's doing it, right? But we can start getting into a little bit more depth and detail when we just actually start doing some analysis. So after this honeypot had come up, the first attack came in roughly 35 minutes after it first came online. But that's okay because it was coming from South Korea and they're our allies, so it's good, right? The first web attack came in from Texas, but that's okay because they're part of our states, right? So we should be good. Well, I had a colleague of mine that I was working with at the time that asked me, he goes, so why do you think these are attacks? Well, one, I never promoted it on a search engine, so I didn't put it out on you know, Bing or Yahoo uh, or that little company called Google. It wasn't part of an existing domain that I spun up a, a new subdomain on, so it was just out there. Again, just threw it online. Plus, I come from the business side. Who are my web app developers in here? Anybody? Anybody ever develop a website? So, <clears throat> I like to look at logs. And even though I'm not very technical, I don't think that that's a normal command call for to come in through a URL. Does that look normal to anybody? No? So what I was able to do was turn around and start painting a picture, and I apologize if you can't see it. So I started having people all over the globe that started hitting my machine, and I'm like, ooh, this is cool. But what can I do with it? I want to take action on it. So I started thinking about, okay, well, I'm prior military. I have a little bit of background in the, you know, how information is collected and gathered and used. Let's talk about developing a threat intelligence program. So what threat intel is not? It's not Google. 
I've had people say, well, you know, we can get information, we can throw it in Google Translator, and you know, no, that's not the, the case. Again, threat intelligence in and of itself is a management program. The way we apply the information we collect is just as important as the tools we use. Realizing the difference between the two is also critical. So some common misconceptions around threat intelligence management is that it's a list of IP addresses and domains. Now, that is source information that can be used potentially, but I will tell you that if you have information that pops up and all of a sudden you're communicating with you know, someplace in South America, that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Um, I was working a, a, with a client, a uh, financial institution, very large financial institution. Nobody could account for why there was a connection down to Colombia. So the security team, being the protectors that they are, killed the circuit at the firewall. They, they stopped denying traffic. And then about 30 minutes later, they got a call saying, why, did you, why is our bank down in Colombia not working? Again, small gap between the, the security practitioners and the business. They'd actually started up new services, and now we had just impacted the business. So bad IP addresses may or may not be bad, and this plays into the necessity for conducting analysis. That you can actually buy threat intelligence. How many have had a vendor that's approached them and say, buy our threat intel? It, it's not threat intelligence. It's not something you can buy. You have to build it organically. They can provide you source feeds, but they cannot provide you an actual threat intelligence offering. It requires the NSA's budget. Now, I wish I had the NSA's budget. I, not even that. I wish I had a fraction of their budget. What I did was turn around and take a lot of open source tools and leverage them in a position that would be able to provide me the information I need, which was cheap and inexpensive. Ultimately, one size doesn't fit all when it comes to threat intelligence. And when I say that, we've all run vulnerability assessments against our networks, yes, no, maybe sometimes. And they come back with these risk rankings of saying, this is high. Well, it's not a cookie cutter approach because what a risk is to my organization is gonna be different than what a risk is to yours. So again, one size doesn't necessarily fit all. Oh, and then it's only for information technology and security people. When we talk about threat intelligence, it plays right into risk management. Risk management is owned by the business. So again, you don't need the million dollar budget. It helps to have a budget to find, not mandatory. What you do need is leadership's commitment and understanding of what threat intelligence actually is. In this case, it was my wife who did not understand threat intelligence or why I was spending all this money on doing this thing. So when we look at threat intelligence, we walk through the different processes. And that goes from planning all the way through action. And ultimately, at its core, it's a business management function. It provides a strategic advantage that allows for tactical application. We can take the information we collect and gather, and we can actually use that. So when we talk about the intelligence universe, we have data coming in from all directions. What we're gonna look at a little bit today is looking at the human side, we're gonna look at the internet, we're gonna look at our own internal systems. So we have this thing in threat intelligence called the ecosystem, new buzzword. It's comprised of all the steps and activities associated with a, an attacker as well as the defender and the process that they go through. And we'll, we'll get to this in a little bit later. So one of the key things that we have to deal with during the planning process is finding out and getting some definite answers from the business. What is it that you want to be advised of? We want to pick up on all chatter and be able to understand, you know, okay, great, give me three headcount. I need one guy who speaks Farsi, another one that speaks Russian, and a guy that speaks Chinese. Um, getting to that point of being able to level set expectations on what the business is actually concerned about. Being able to know where you can collect information. Being able to know how valid that information is, what your confidence in that is. Because data comes from a lot of different areas. There is no lack or shortage of where we get it from. But we ultimately have to turn it into something that we need to be able to use. Has anybody ever looked at a live 
uh, network packet stream, you know, TCP dump. Do we understand that right off the, the bat, or do we have to decode it and turn it into something? Same thing in threat intelligence. You get a lot of raw data that we can collect. Again, the collection, when it is accessible, how available, what is, you know, the confidence in the source. Is this somebody that threw up a honeypot that's not doing any analysis whatsoever, or is somebody behind it looking at it and vetting the information? Is it relevant to your organization? If you hear about a new vulnerability that's popping and hitting, you know, Unix systems, and you're a Windows shop, is that relevant to you? Probably not. Some of the areas of different types of feeds that come in, their formats, you know, we have the automated and internet side, we can pull that down through multiple different ways, whether it's through WGET, RSS feeds, pulling it down and actually getting the, the raw data. We can also get it through human element side of the house where we're talking with somebody and we're, you know, you're, you're sitting there talking to a colleague who may be in the same industry but not the same company, and they may share with you, hey, we're seeing these types of attacks. You can take that and leverage that as well. Again, there is no shortage of information that is available, nor the formats that it comes out in. So let's talk a little bit about analysis. The, the key, one of the key areas that we're going to hit on a little bit later more in detail. We have to analyze and normalize the data and put it into a way that we can consume it. We have to validate it or do we trust it blindly? We want to validate it. Then we have to assess it and see what it is that we're actually looking at. Are we looking at a new O-Day that's popped that we're just on the front end seeing? Or is this something that's very innocuous? Then we categorize it. We put it into a block for action later on. Is this something that's highly critical to our organization? Is it impacting sensitive information? Or is this, again, an end map scan against our network because we're in a financial service industry? That might happen on a regular basis. Again, when we talk about threat intelligence management, the next phase we want to talk about is production. What are we producing with the information that we collect? Well, it has to be actionable. We have to be able to do something with it. Otherwise, is it of any value? Probably not. Holistically in view of the entire organization. Now, we tend to, to focus on the, the um, where our corporate headquarters are. And to use a case study real quick on, on the target breach, do you think that they ever for a moment thought of an HVAC vendor out of Pennsylvania when it came to assessing their security? I can tell you, based upon what happened, no, they did not. However, what it does indicate is that the attackers are. Our adversaries that are coming up against our organizations, they are thinking about those types of ve vectors. Has to be flexible. So ultimately what I ended up doing was building a, a series of platforms to use. Um, any of those who've ever used those easy to use tools that are native to Unix and Linux languages like SED, awk, grep, yeah, the ones that aren't so well documented. They allowed me to be able to take that information in, ingest it and turn around and produce some information that I could use. Every open source project out there known to man can be leveraged in some way, shape, or form. Um, and there's no, there is no uh, limit to what you can leverage if you're creative and thinking. Allowed for a highly customizable environment is a good way of saying that, you know, I made it do what I want. So ultimately what I ended up doing was coming across and was able to track down a application called SIF, Collective Intelligence Framework. And this allowed me to start aggregating information in, ingesting it, and then coming back and looking at it. Now, we're all fine being able to look at a command line, right? Now, put yourself in the business side. Do you think they'll understand that for a second? No. So getting creative, we created a dashboard. Now, will they be able to understand this? A lot easier than having to read a, a dashboard, or a uh, command line. So then I was able to pull out some additional information of bad things going on around the globe and how it impacted the organization. Again, and this differed from Norse and, and you know, some of the threat maps that we see out there in that it was specific to the environment that I had structured specifically for this. So then we could, what I ended up doing 
was getting a number of collection points for analysis that would allow me to turn around and produce something. So whether it was a new IP firewall or a uh, new firewall rule set, whether it was dropping something at the boundary, I had the ability now to actually look and see and take action and find out, you know, or prevent things from going on, which is the key thing, being able to take action with what we know. Specifically, in this case, action against bad things or things that we had perceived as being bad. So from a technical aspect, you know, my hardware quickly became more than what my wife thought was reasonable. Um, plus, has anybody else ever had to explain or justify getting a 40 amp few, or, you know, circuit put into their house? Probably not. Not an easy sell. Again, open source platforms were used. Number one, they were free. There are a ton of them that you can choose from. They're free. They run on legacy hardware, which is great because legacy is cheaper, right? Did I mention they were free? So the entry level for a business organization is relatively low, especially when you start talking about virtualizing systems. So you can make the business case for them. Well, what that ended up resulting in is I needed to focus more on the analysis side of the house. I was getting now approximately between 960 and 14, 100 megabits or megabytes per hour to process, which is what spawned that again. Because as I'm pulling in this information, I'm sucking up bandwidth. Then we created a little lab to, to teach people how to do this on their own, which of course, do you guys know where this is going to lead me to again? Back to Jared. So overview of this, we look at it, you know, who's interested in us? We're able to look at some of the new attack profiles. I gotta watch that speaker. We can start seeing malicious things happen. Also, I could start planning mitigation tactics. I could start planning to do things with what I collected. Again, updating, identifying malware quickly. These are all types of things that we can now do based upon the information that we collected and aggregated. And of course, for the business folks, being able to draw maps and dashboards, that's like critical. Same reason why we put up the Norse map when the executives walk in the room, because it looks important. So let's dive into a little bit of the analysis. <clears throat> so, saw a number of, uh, of the systems that were getting hit by honeypots. And if you've ever seen and pulled information out, we can see this. You know, and this is from a very short snapshot, but we can see that you know, they're trying one, two, three, four, five, six, admin and root, admin, to get in. Which is, we were able to pull that back and, and tie it to a couple of platforms to see exactly you know, what they might be looking for. So we were seeing brute force attacks occur against privileged accounts which default credentials, they, they are gonna be used in attacks. But does that buy us any additional information? Well, let's actually get into something that's not root, something that's different, something that may create some additional information for us. So from some of the information we were able to collect, we were able to see that you know support support belongs to US robotics. Well, that's interesting. I don't run any USR. This was interesting. Machine hypervisors, you know, interesting cloud-based system. The next interesting one, I'd never seen this before until I started looking up. Somebody was looking specifically for polycom servers that might be connected to the internet. Well, what are polycom systems used for? Anybody? Telephones. Telephones. Communications. Why would somebody, why might somebody be interested in what we're talking about? Because they can listen in on your traffic. There you go. So pulled some information. I had an outlier right here that was not like the rest, but you know, hey, in true Mandiant fashion, I'm gonna pull up a map and, and see where that goes. However, when I started analyzing some of the information around it, collecting of the, the agent strings and analyzing it started showing some additional information that we could use to better protect ourselves. 
start seeing actually what they were using. <clears throat> I didn't even realize that there was an SSH library for .NET. To, to, you know, it, not only that, but that somebody actually coded a way to brute force with it. So it was like, ooh, okay. This one was really interesting because when I saw that one, I was like, okay, there were six attempts over the time span. This is rather interesting. Until I came across that article that explained that there was a vulnerability associated with it. And I was like, okay, so we probably have a victim's machine that's being used to pivot and go out to other areas. So being in the industry for as long as we have, we tend to see that... Um, some of the information that comes back, we can automatically tell and say, this is a botnet attack. We can look at the patterns here. We see the escalation in, in information. We see common threads. However, having to explain to the business why this is a, a botnet, well, we took this information and time seriesed it. So where we have a one, oh, and this is over a one minute period. So we see a number of login attempts being made over a single minute which if you ever tried to pa enter your password in, if you have to do it you know, 38 times that we see here, is that humanly possible? So we can probably say that this IP address is probably part of a bot network. And if I may please interrupt you, um, is there any way possible that this could be a Tor R role, meaning they just keep switching uh, Tor servers on a randomized basis? Their, their IP address doesn't change. No, for the for this one specifically. So one of the things I found out was the, these folks liked putty, and it actually was tied back to the Tuwan College. Guess where? China. However, anybody use putty? Anybody download putty recently? The, does from the legit site? They make putty available in multiple languages to include Chinese. Yet we see here, when we cross-referenced it, that's all the English standard language. Now, if you're attacking a, a foreign national, are you going to program in your language or another language? So does this necessarily mean that they are that's who my, my adversary actually is? No. Judging by the fact that they are a, a college and we know that academic institutions love to spend money to protect their systems, right? Exactly. So why analysis is important? So this I got from a colleague of mine and I want you guys to watch this real quick and tell me what you can pick up on. Is anybody unfamiliar with the commands that are being issued? No. Why is it repeating that same command up? You want to make sure that it's executable, right? So to keep in mind, this is a Kippo honeypot, which allows somebody to brute force the root account and gain access. It's also a, a type of jailed environment that creates a mock pseudo world, but it doesn't necessarily allow um, you to run all the, the commands, but it gives the presence like you are actually in there. So it's like a Something like that. Has anybody picked up on it yet? Is this a bot net script or is it a person? It's a person. So when you see something like this ha actually happen live, it's like full restraint to keep from breaking in on the session and talking with them. Yeah. <laughs> because it's like, it, you, you need to realize you're in a honeypot. And I wanted to be like, hey, you're gonna make a presentation out of this. So we saw initially that a script was being downloaded at the very beginning. Now th this was the funny part because you, you never want to assume that the adversary or the attacker is coming in from you know, their world. They're probably going to bounce out. They're going to pivot through somebody else. So I don't want to assume that this is the, the domain. 
So we went ahead and grabbed the domain, and we see that there's another, or the uh, script. We see that there's another script that's being called, so we went ahead and grabbed that as well. Now, this, and I did not make this up for the love of God. So, <clears throat> Yeah, this could this could be this could be a false flag because if I'm if I'm trying to do something I, I don't want attention brought to me. So I was like, okay, this can't really be this easy. You know, I've got a lot of information in here, and you know, let's take a look. And I'm I'm pulling excerpts out. So the first site that I had pulled was the Bytes site, Bytes.com, which redirected me. Which this is one of the things I, I cracked up on when I got this. Um, system space 32.exe failure now. First of all, can anybody tell me what OS I'm running? Mac. Mac. But yet I'm I am my my system 32 EXE has failed. Ooh. Oh you better run it. You better call. <laughs> I, I exactly. I so wanted to call them and I was like, yeah, no, I don't have enough time to do that. We made a good recording. It, it I'm I'm sure it would. In fact, don't give me ideas. My wife will hate you for the end of time. <laughs> So we started pulling up some information, and, and lo and behold, the, the individual we had identified that left their information in the scripts actually existed, and I was like, oh, this cannot get any better. So let's start taking a look at some information. He runs a, a uh, YouTube channel, and I was like, oh, okay, you know, not a lot of subscribers, you know, but hey, he's got followers. Um, so I started, you know, start off with the basics, when, oh my goodness, look, yeah, same name, same guy. This could not be that simple, right? You know, oh, okay, find out, okay, he's out of Singapore, not a problem. Start pulling out some information. This is the company that they actually run. And we started looking at some information, you know, what they do. They provide drop bear, VPN, virtual private services, and I'm like, this cannot get any better. Oh no, it gets better. Not yet. So found out he also owns another domain. Again, he's got the the Huthus. So the, the, I'm actually the person who's doing this is is actually maybe the actual attacker. You know, so let's check Facebook and yep. So now I have an actual pic. So I mean, now I can do the entire like Mandiant report. You know, APT one. You know, I track the attacker back to Singapore. I'm halfway tempted to email the guy now that I know all the information and say, hey, can I have you at a talk? I need you to come to the U.S. After this video is uploaded, you should take that and put it under one of his videos as like a video response. Pay for his that, that was <laughs> like, I'm going to be my whipping boy. So, you know, so let's talk about, you know, the, the business value that we can bring. And, and, and I'll try to keep it a little light. So the threats that we face are, are stymied by the fact that we are competing against this. The Hollywood romanticized hackers. This is what our executives, this is what our business leadership sees. You know, they see this and this is who they think is after us, you know, the 16 year old in our, in our basement. And we're having to overcome that. We're having to, to get through there. Now, if any of your execs think the matrix is what they're, yeah. Duracell batteries. So, you know, ultimately, this is part of what we're having to overcome. So, and of course, I can't, uh, no security conference on, would be complete without mention of Black Hat. So, I've been doing this for a quarter of a century, um, which means I'm old. I have never been able to find, and the quality's not good, that, you know, the, the actual to do script for the malware is actually that easy to find. In 25 years, I have never had a nuclear reactor explode. Never had to chase anybody down the streets in a foreign country, although after finding out he's in Singapore, that may be a possibility now. <laughs> Nor have I had to ever draw down on somebody for perpetuating an attack. In fact, this is the common thread that we usually get lumped in. You know, we're over the laptop, we're wearing, you know, working with our hoodie over our head. You know, it, it is. Um, you know, however, Thanks to, to Black Hat, you know, now this is what we have the chance to be. <clears throat> you know, which my wife would be really happy if I looked that good. Um, so, you know, now we've, I'm, I'm blending the two. So why threat intelligence now? Why is it becoming a thing? 
Well, being able to, to leverage actionable intelligence can prevent larger impacts. If we can stop a, a known C2 from being able to, or our systems to be able to access a known C2, those systems may get infected, but they can't exfiltrate information. We have a responsibility to protect our organizations. The threats are real, you know, and helping educate our, our staff on this is important. We can proactively defend ourselves. How many of us are used to, to reactive organizations where you know, it's one fire to the next, to the next, to the next? That gets old and we burn out really quick. Can I ask you a question? Sure. All right, um, so your um, reaction, um, how, how does it uh, proactively separate that segment of uh, material and not only separate but learn from it and pass that on to the rest of the hosts in the network to watch out for those values. Hit, hit me up and we can talk about that after. That's a <laughs> very detailed question. All right. Thank you, sir. That's not one that I can say yes or no to right away. Okay. Thank you, sir. We can also change the way we operate. Hey, this isn't working. Antivirus doesn't catch it anymore. Or pardon me, what, what is it now? Endpoint security is the new thing. So ultimately, we can take this information and become a business enabler. We can identify some common information. We can identify whether or not we're being targeted by a criminal syndicate, a nation state, a hacktivist organization. We can identify some information about where they're coming from. We can develop a profile. We can be able to answer how they're coming to, to come after me. We know that you know, this organization uses spear phishing from these domains. We can get out in front of it. We can overall, from an IT operations and security operations perspective, get out in front and enhance the operational capabilities for our organizations. Or what I like to say is, hug the life out of the attack cycle. So when we talk about the field of battle, what we're focusing in on when it comes to this, peri this period is the sooner we can catch an adversary doing something and the sooner we can, we can block them and, and thwart them, the less impact it's going to have to our organization. Everybody know what this is? The Cult of Clopper? The, the cyber kill chain, which runs through the stages that a adversary has to take in order to compromise a network. Their ultimate end state goal is to exfiltrate information. Um, whether that information is being used to herd you know, other botnets within the organization or being used to mine Bitcoin. They're going to want to get some type of information out. It may be your intellectual property. It may be credit card information, patient health information. So where we look at it, we can disrupt them. We, we really can't control reconnaissance or weaponization of, of that. What we can have some capability is around whether or not we disrupt their delivery. If we identify known spam locations, known phishing attacks, and put those in and block them in, before they get to us, we've already, we've already disrupted that. We have to make them change their, their tactics and their approach that they take when attacking us. When it comes to exploitation, this is where things like change management, configuration standards, and you know, solid patching cycles is critical. Again, another method to disrupt. Command and control, being able to get that information and put it in. Again, if a system gets infected, we can turn around and prevent it from calling back and beaconing out. And then getting to the exfiltration portion. How do we do that? Well, we monitor our networks. You can't. You, you cannot logically go beyond that because if it's not been weaponized, you can't utilize it. An attacker or an adversary can't but use it. In the, in the same note, it can be weaponized, delivered, and exfiltrated all in the same. That's a process, not the the life cycle. So a little bit different thought. Okay. Okay. So ultimately and ideally, this is where we want to 
try and disrupt a, as much as possible before they can deliver it. If they do, if they are successful in delivery, how do we disrupt them from an exploitation standpoint? Ingress and egress filters. This failing to prevent the attack in the earlier stages. This is where we're left to work at, and this is when things go bad. So we want to make sure that when we're looking at this. If we've made it to this stage, it's, it's going to be a bad day all around. So things to, 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 to disrupt successful delivery, again, getting out and getting those information, educating our end, point, or our end users, being able to reverse known bad malware, because a lot of times the attackers will use commodity malware and they will reuse what they have. Antivirus is not the answer. However, knowing your assets and your applications and how and who they're talking to is important. If we know what the applications are talking to, we have the logs coming in that we're able to review, we're able to get out in front of these things and stop exploitation from happening. Or at least be alerted early on that we can take proactive measures and, and raise the fire alarm. When it comes to command and control, the only thing that at that point that we're going to have to rely on is the ability for continuous monitoring and our incident response capabilities. How many of you have very well-defined practices and procedures and a playbook in the event of an incident? If something bad happens, do you know what you're able to do? So other areas that we can do is sinkhole and black hole those, those DNS entries of known bad and reduce that chatter. Again, exfiltration. Are we going to know what's actually leaving our network? Do we, are we monitoring our network on a regular basis? Do we know what good is on our network? Have we baselined it? Do we know who we're talking to? Or are we going to accidentally shut down a bank in Colombia because nobody told us about it? Um, do you do further inspection um, on the, the payload data itself to where if they had already seen your traffic and how your traffic flowed, they were routing through and then vicariously exfiltrating out. Yes. Okay. So I'm very lucky that I work with one of the, the top SANS instructors, a gentleman by the name of Malware Jake, who that's what he lives and dies. He, he dissects malware. Um, so we're able to catalog that information and then reference it later on um, to see if this is something new, if it's a variation, or if it's you know somebody that's got a script and able to run it. So the cost of failure, the good news is, is usually on this part, there's really no cost to us as an organization. When we start getting into the exploitation, that's when the money starts racking up. When we get into exfiltration, this is when your fine penalties, litigation start, this is when things get really bad, and you're gonna see this guy. <laughs> you're either gonna be asking him for, for a loan, or he's gonna be there to tell you that you are Fired. So when it comes to threat intelligence, what are some of the common obstacles that we have to overcome? Well, number one is capitalism. As we're seeing right now, every vendor in the space, even those that you would never think were in the industry, are now offering a threat intelligence feed because people want to make money on it. Our legal and general counsel, it's really interesting to see their perspective because if we identify malware beaconing out to an organization that's not ours, we might have to report that, that we've been breached. So they don't really want to know that. Also, as an organization, we don't want to be perceived as being weak. Because if we have to disclose that, hey, we've been breached, are we weak? No, we just don't have the resources that we need. Are we disclosing too much information? Well, do we lack the supporting infrastructure? Do we have the tools, the skills, the resources we need? Most importantly, do we have the support and commitment of leadership? Or did they come back from a conference and say, we need threat intelligence? Another thing is knowing your environment, knowing who you're communicating with, what information is transferring, how that information is. You know, are we like the OPM where everything's unencrypted and we're just transferring data back and forth? Or is everything encrypted? Is it commensurate? Is it being protected commensurate with the impact it can have to the organization? Because this looks nice 
and you know vendors come in and they're like, oh, look at you know buy our threat intelligence. The one thing I would challenge you all to do is if you get into that situation where they want you to buy the threat intelligence, ask one question and one question of them and see if they can answer it. Why is it a threat to me? So my contact information, and I did tell everybody at the beginning that there would be a giveaway. Um, so here's my contact information. Using open, and here's the challenge. I have a free DerbyCon ticket for anybody who can get this information and send it to me. First one in. Is it cheating if I answer? Yes. And with that, I'll open the floor to any additional questions. So, uh, looking at the, the threat intelligence, both like things that are out there already as far as Python, like threat activator, combine, things like that, or threat IQ, how are you, are you using any of those yes. now? Yes. And then, so, what are your formats you're trying to, so you, like you put them in XML, things like that, but is there any like Stix Taxi, CEF, format that you're trying to get into and like what are some of the ways that you've got around that hurdle? So to, to answer that question, the, the first thing I always do is I define the problem. What is the problem I'm trying to solve? And then I put it in the format that's going to work best. If it's just me dealing with it, I can read a command line and I'm fine. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm working with business leadership, I might use something like, uh, do you guys know Harbor Master? You follow him on Twitter? He made a great little thing called IP Pew Pew. And oh, yeah. it's a, a threat map. The, the fun part is, is you can actually structure that to your organization based upon what your organization is seeing from the logs and, and information. And now instead of having to throw up the Norse map, right. you can show in context of your business with sound effects that actually is able to demonstrate, you know, this is what we're seeing on a regular basis. This is how we're being attacked. Ultimately, though, it's going to be based upon the audience. Um, ingesting that information, you're going to have the information provided differently to somebody who's a firewall administrator versus somebody who's an IDS administrator versus somebody who's in the C-suite looking at you going, where is my money going? Um, that dashboard you showed, was that Kibana, Elasticsearch? Yes, that's the Elk stack. Right, the best detection because you're collecting all the data that's one thing but actually analyzing that in real time or near real time uh, is the same the best approach for correlation or are there better so for correlation in events like that there's another talk that I do called the answer is 42 that talks specifically about that um, it can leverage a lot of the same technologies capabilities processes um, it's just, yes, I, I'm, I'm big on an analysis. I want to see what's going on. I want to be able to run it through and balance that information based upon that. Um, if, if in that uh, initial inspection uh, stage, are you, are you going to go ahead and execute this information that's obviously arbitrary? prior and then alert the rest of the nodes on the network of any intrusive behaviors um, that could be defined in any set of payload that could be defined in the initial process. So to answer the question, it all depends upon the business needs. For example, if I see suspicious activity coming off of my uh, transaction processing switch, if I'm a payment processor, and I suspect that it's been compromised and I'm seeing traffic go someplace else, Am I going to take that system offline and start doing the analysis? I'm not saying taking it offline. I'm saying doing a immediate deep dive of the packet case to find out more intelligence over what it's doing, what it's um, what it's either trying to exfiltrate or um, process as a, as, as a command in your network. I'm going to look at it and see what it's doing. Okay. Um, and that and one of the reasons why analysis is so important because you can get a piece of malware. If, for example, if you're a payment processor and you get a piece of malicious software in your environment that you've identified that this is bad, you might have to report a breach, especially if it's exfiltrating credit card information. However, at the same token, if you're able to reverse engineer and take a look at it and find out that it's part of a larger botnet that's sending out spam relay or is acting as a spam relay, would you have to disclose that? 
general counsel will weigh in and probably give you the best advice. Um, if no credit card is being disclosed, you may get a pass. Any recommendations for, I guess, tuning out some of the noise? Time. <laughs> The, the key part that are a lot of our organizations that, that we work with is that we inherit the network from somebody else. And we're really great as an industry documenting our network infrastructure and who we're talking with. So it's going to take some time, and that's one of the things to convey to management is that, hey, listen, this is going to take some time to, to get them to understand and, and you know, find out what good is. Um, you know, I've worked with some organizations that have been like, hey, We've got $800,000 to buy this feed from vendor X. And my recommendation to them is, no, no, don't buy that feed. Get some resources, get some human capital, get some analysts. I would rather take that $800,000 investment instead of an annual cost for a source feed from somebody, put that into bodies that knows my environment, that understands my business, and can find bad on their own. Can you go to the previous slide? I have the skills and capabilities. So, the question I've got, and it seems like there's clearly two dynamics that are uh, contention, of course. Um, one being the immediacy of analysis, the other being the sort of depth of analysis, right? Like tracking that over time. How are, how are you balancing that out? Like in your own thinking, how do you, how do you tend to balance that? So I'm a workaholic, so that's not a fair question to ask. Um, because there have been many nights that I've started like working on analysis of something like on you know three o'clock on Friday, and then the next thing I know, my wife's saying, "Hey, it's 7 a.m. You need to take the boys to school," and I'm like, "But it's Friday," and she's like, "No, no, it's Monday." Um, you have to find that that balance, and keep in mind that when you build a threat intelligence management program, you're going to have a manager, you're going to have reverse engineers, you're going to have analysts, and they're going to focus on their areas. So, you know, a new, you know, new collection effort has, has yielded, you know, we found these binaries on our system that are bad. So immediately we know we can start hashing those to go out and start looking for other badness. We hand that off to the reverse engineers who are able to sit there and tell us what it actually does. Then we can start making some more well-informed decisions about what is it that we're going to do. Um, but yes, it's, it's always one of those things of, what does it do, and how do we respond? So I've got four minutes before the next speaker, so I'm going to have to turn this off. Thank you all for coming. Especially opposite.